up to the table. And it looks like we have a special guest here, Dave Hill. Colonel Hayes, I present the Launch Learning Fellows. Hello, Hello everyone. <laughs> you probably already have heard me talk enough. As, as, as we were walking over, somebody may have kind of ratted, ratted a couple of you out saying that you had listened to me talk earlier, but you didn't raise your hand to ask a question for some reason that's not apparent to me. So now we have this opportunity to put you on the spot and force questions to be asked. <laughs> I, I feel like the tables have been turned. Okay, so I'm gonna start with that table has to produce a question. Uh-oh, no pressure. Okay. <laughs> Way to be a good teammate there. <laughs>
happened once or twice while I'm sleeping in that sleeping bag. There's a hood that goes over it. Kind of turn sideways inadvertently in there. You can get yourself a carbon dioxide in it pretty quick by just inadvertently suffocating yourself. So space is a crazy place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, so is we were supporting the couple of things. One was the amount of science that the Russians had on their list didn't, in their estimation, support a three-person Russian crew. So they only needed two Russians on board to do everything that was on their plate. The second aspect is that frees up the sea seat swap with another swimmers. So we were planning on going uphill as a two-person crew, potentially going down with an extra person. Um, didn't end up working out. You saw, the, you saw that, that swap still happen when I launched with Christina and then I landed with Zah. That allowed Christina to extend to do an extra you know, two missions and then come down and fall back So it, there's a little bit of juggling. You need two people to operate this course. They've actually, since I've formed, come up with another hand controller that they're using in the Soyuz so that they can fly with just one Russian uh, commander and then have two, essentially two persons come along, and they did that. Right? They, they sent up a film crew where they had the leading actress and the producer fly out there to spend time and come back down to a different commander. Yes, we move tables. <laughs> I don't know if it's, I don't know the cause, but fluid shift is definitely a real thing. I think it's a contributing factor. I spent a good chunk of my time up there feeling like I had a slight nipple. Your heart on the ground right now, it's fighting, my heart's fighting gravity, trying to keep the blood in my head and keep it out of my feet. When I go up on orbit, it's still, it's spent its whole life doing that, so it, kind of keeps doing that, so you get higher pressure in your head than you used to. And that leads to a sense of fullness, so a lot of times you'll see that as puffy faces when you're seeing people that are on orbit, especially for the first couple of weeks that you're up there, it's really puffy. Um, that's one part of it. The other part is, I talked about carbon dioxide, so the station atmosphere, the temperature's normal, the, the humidity is a normal uh, humidity, the pressure is sea level pressure, so 14.7 psi, but the composition is different. So it's got a lot of oxygen, it's got a lot of nitrogen, and it's got about an order of magnitude more carbon dioxide than what you have on there. That allows them not to drive the, the sea through, so the carbon dioxide scrub that we have. It allows them not to push the hardware as far as scrubbing out all the carbon dioxide. But we also think that it leads to intermittent headaches and, and stuffiness. So taste changes. Um, it changes for other reasons too. So get up there first day, uh, one night's sleep, get up in the morning, I'm like, I'm gonna have coffee, I'm gonna get started, just get my mission going. This is day two. And I have some black coffee and the motion sick adaptation hadn't really so that trigger just like, oh, I just don't feel good. I never drink black coffee the rest of the mission, all 202 days remaining, because my mind had associated just people like crud with the black coffee. So if you've already done all that estimation, and your mind does this really fast, but it's doing it with gravity as part of the calculation. So I know I'm going to need to loft a little bit. If I back up, I'm going to have to loft a little more and throw it a little harder. And just, it's not just me doing this. Every person in this room is doing that. And then you will build, it will just be this weird experience if it does something that you didn't expect. So if I throw it, and well, I will throw it somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes like you expect, it's no big deal. That's like how everything's supposed to work. But if it doesn't, then it looks odd. And so that's the adaptation that my mind made up there. And I think it was around the 
one point where every prediction I made was starting just to predict how things should float. Up until that point, to a lesser degree every day, my mind, things just looked weird because they weren't doing what they were supposed to do. And then when I got down on the ground, I got to experience the opposite, where I was expecting things to fall, but you know, I'm smart, I know there's gravity, it's going to fall, but it, it just looked like it was ten times heavier than it should have been. And so that's something that is really hard to separate out and talk about, because you haven't seen the other part of it. So that did exactly what everybody was <laughs> I enjoyed math. 
when I got to college, I realized I enjoyed the, the stuff where I got to break things and understand what made things work and put it back together. So I stumbled into being an engineer. I liked space because of the childhood dream. So then I started studying astronautical engineering. And maybe down the road, maybe I'll try to be an astronaut, but I couldn't see the connection. It wasn't until several years later when I started getting involved with flight tests. I realized that, so I like that mechanical part. I like to make things do things and explain why it happened. But the flight testing, the flight test portion, and you ended up working in a team of like six to eight people. And you know, all highly competent in their particular disciplines. And then you go out and you manage a project and do something really complicated, really risky, and you all depend on each other. And in the height of executing some kind of high-risk test where we're throwing a jet out of control and trying to recover it. I found I started to lose my sense of self and just identified as the team and being part of that. I was so excited. And then I looked at what NASA does and it's the exact same thing. So then I said, okay, I'm going to apply. I applied. I got rejected. And five years later I applied again. I got rejected. And then five years later I applied again. And if I had to look back at the moment I was selected and said, okay, why did this happen? I could have done So I, I never tell students to, hey, this is, these are the boxes you need to check. Okay. Follow your dreams, do something that you're miraculous at, be an amazing teammate. And, and, and you know, if you think something is going to, if you want to get into something and you think it's going to be a certain way, try it. I would never want anybody to become an astronaut that had not spent a week camping in the woods because that's what we're doing when we're camping. Um, but that shows a mission as well. You've been patient, thank you. Well, I was thinking it's sick. Like, you have to have a center for the condition. Yeah, so if we get sick, there is a pharmacy up there. There is a team of flight docs on the ground. They uh, can prescribe stuff. Talk on the radio, we can do a video conference, we can take photos, you get a rash, I'll take a photo, I'll send it down, we'll outsource it to some you know, national or now, so and so, and we'll let you know if you're <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the The other thing they do is we receive medical training. So I'm an engineer, but they taught me how to draw blood, they taught me how to put in an IV, they taught me how to do basics like CPR or even the advanced stuff where you're starting to inject epinephrine and I'm injecting stuff straight into the bone. Is anybody familiar with, with how that happens in an EMS, EMT situation? So they teach us all that, how to do sutures, how to pull teeth, how to try to temporarily fill a cavity. You name it, they try to teach you how to do it. Um, but not here. <laughs> So they train the crew. There's a large enough chunk of the astronaut corps that are doctors. The odds are there's going to be a doctor on board, but there's no requirement to have a doctor on the space station. That's all the medical stuff. There's the psychological stuff. So every two weeks you meet with your psych support team and you talk to your psychiatrist and psychologist that have been talking with you throughout the two years leading up to that. They're also meeting with your
if I measure the pressure in my feet, the pressure is going to be much higher than the pressure in my head. And so we always measure right here, right about the same level of heart, so that we can get a consistent measurement. On orbit, it's the same pressure. All the way around. Um, as they go out to the real world? 